thank you very much for um, for for joining us today, um, and, and welcome to the Young Dementia Network webinar. Just to confirm that, I'm Tessa Guttridge. I'm uh, Young Dementia Network's chair, and um, we're today we're continuing our series addressing the different issues relevant to diagnosis experience for people um, with young onset dementia and their families. We've been running these for a few months now. Um, today in particular, we're looking at improving the diagnosis process for people with atypical symptoms. And that's, of course, very relevant uh, for, the, for those with young onset. We've invited the right people to help us understand this better, of course. Um, welcome Nikki Zimmerman, Direct Support Lead, Rare Dementia Support, and Dr. Natalie Ryan, welcome also a consultant neurologist. Um, off screen, we've got uh, Catherine and uh, Catherine Kylie and Kate Ballow supporting us from the Young Dementia Network. Uh, back to Nikki and Natalie. The plan for this next hour is uh, both uh, will offer us presentations on what the person and the family can expect from each of their um, services. And then there'll be time for your question and, and um, uh, hopefully some um, really good answers for you. Can you please put the questions in the Q&A function for us so that we can easily find them rather than the chat? And um, we've got about 400 or so registrants for today's webinar. And um, attendees, as usual, aren't on camera and uh, mic. And uh, although we'd love to see you, um, it, it works better without being able to do that. But we absolutely would encourage you to use the chat freely and um, we'll be, Kate and Catherine will be posting some useful links for you um, during the webinar too. So first, um, first up though, we, we want to have the perspective always of a person living with young onset dementia. And um, just to start us off really, uh, let's see now Nikki in conversation with Julie who has posterior cortical atrophy. Can you take us to that Catherine, thank you. Hello, I'm Nikki Zimmerman. I'm the direct support team lead at Rare Dementia Support and I'm absolutely delighted to be here for this webinar today and to be joined by Julie who's been living with PCA. Hello Julie. Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now um, we're talking today about improving the assessment and diagnostic process and pathway for people living with dementia at a young age but that uh, have some atypical or uncommon like symptoms. And I know that you're really passionate about improving this because you didn't have the best of experiences yourself within sort of this process. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that to start off the webinar today? Um, yes, yeah. Um, so uh, I was having problems um, at work and at home and forgetting very important things and eventually I went to um, my GP and got referred after a long period of time to the um, teams involved in my diagnosis. Um, when I did get diagnosed after various scans and tests um, I was asked to attend to hospital by myself alone and then when I went in to see the consultant he proceeded to tell me after showing me some scans that didn't mean a lot to me at the time um, that I had Alzheimer's and so I asked okay what what can we what can I do um, and basically he was saying there isn't anything that we can do for you we can just support you um and they there is an admiral nurse but they weren't available on that day so it was a hell of a shock and made me feel like my whole world was ending very soon and i went i drove back to my daughter's after the appointment and and just cried for a long time and it was pretty traumatic and it did really feel like that was the end of of me that i was going to be going down a little hole and be gone quite quickly 
and there was nothing I could do about it. So that was the most awful experience. And then my family heard about what was going on with me and spent a lot of time finding out things that might support me, help me, give me information. That's how I found the um, Alzheimer's Society and and I've ended up joining the PCA group, things like that. Now, I really could have done with right at the beginning. Um, there is support there, there is information, there is help, there is lots of people living with this and they're living for it a long time. And considering when you get a diagnosis, it's limiting your life every day is so important and your whole future is so important. Um, the depression is bad enough without thinking that the end is nigh. It was just the worst thing to happen in my life. The worst thing anyone, I think, anyone could be told is that they've got Alzheimer's and there is nothing else they can tell you. So that's sort of pretty much how, how it was for me and how it's, my family has gone on looking at medication that would help me. And um, that has been great. Um, it has actually helped. Uh, and that is through and going onto various other websites that other people use, um, seeing what they've done, seeing what helps them, and sort of wading my way through lots of, of information and finding out would that be helpful for me. Quite tricky. Um, and yeah, it is hard to find out some things. I don't want to find out everything straight away. Um, but yes, thank goodness for the people that are around me now. Um, it just, yeah, it could have been a, so much better. And um, thank you for listening now. And I hope that other people will have a better experience in the future because it's so important with any sort of disease. You just need a way forward and you need hope. And that's what I want everyone to get from now on, if, if that's what we can do. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Um, with your Alzheimer's disease, it's, it's not just Alzheimer's, is it? It's an atypical Alzheimer's. It's posterior cortical atrophy, PCA. Yeah. And would have that yeah. been really helpful at the beginning, knowing that there was different symptoms and, you know, a much more structured and specialised pathway for you? That would have been really the best that would have been the much better outcome from my experience with the consultant i needed to understand i he just waffled something about and what well, alzheimer's and pca and i didn't know what that meant and it was yeah later i found out what that was about and later again i i was part of a pca group and we meet regularly and my goodness that is an eye opener um, and that has given me hope and that has given me me back again because I think, oh, there is hope in having some sort of life and I am doing that now, but that wasn't what had happened at the time. And I still feel that I'm finding out things that they haven't really explained to me. So it's really education at an early stage knowing the specialities of the skilled workers that can be involved in your care early on and what the processes are which would be really helpful and i hopefully from our webinar today we're going to what we're going to talk through sort of the different processes of a specialist referral and a specialist center and how that can be helpful for people so i'm i'm hoping there's going to be some really good take-home messages today and hopefully that people will go away with some hope um, and learn from the experience that you've had, Julie. So thank you very much. Thank you. Got every admiration for, for Julie and people like her who experience, you know, so, such um, struggle really with, with their condition and then finding out, um, finding support for the, and information about their condition and, and still being prepared to 
try and improve it for, for other people. Um, yeah, every. Let me hand over to Nikki, who's going to, uh, to, to take us through the, the next part of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. And a huge thanks to Julie for sharing a story with us, with, with me today, um, and for all the work that she does with us. It, she, she's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm just about to share my screen here and get these up. Here we go. Um, it's, it's just amazing to hear Julie's story, and it's not uncommon. Um, a lot of people really do struggle with the navigation, with the post-diagnostic support, with, with even getting a diagnosis. And we're going to talk through a bit about that today. So um, for those of you that are joining today that haven't met me before, my name is Nikki Zimmerman, and I lead the team of support workers at Rare Dementia Support. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about us and a bit about what we do. Huh. Well, we'll do it. I can share the screen. Oh, goodness. Here we go. Let's try again. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that, everybody. So first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about Rare Dementia Support. So we are based in London. We're based, um, the services provided by the Dementia Research Centre, which is part of uh, University College London. Um, and we're funded by the National Brain Appeal. We support people they are affected by seven types of rare dementias. We know there's over a hundred different types of rare dementias, but we only support people from these seven different types because we're associated with the research center and this is what we do research in. Um, we support people that are living with the diagnosis and their carers and bereaved carers as well. So we don't discharge people from our services. We've always got some form of support there. And these are the seven ones here. So young onset Alzheimer's disease, posterior cortical atrophy, primary progressive aphasias, familiar Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and familiar, <laughs> familiar frontotemporal dementia and Lewy bodies dementia as well. And we have clinical leads which uh, work with us in the support. Um, so when we are doing our seminars, our webinars, we've always got that clinical and research expertise that goes along with our support. And this is the direct support team that works alongside me. We're not a huge team and we all have several different roles. A couple of the members of the team are doing their PhD. Some of the team work part time and we're all sort of spinning plates doing other roles along with this. So what do we actually do? Well, we are a service. We're a non-clinical service, but we are clinically informed. Like I said, we've got the clinician sort of uh, in the background with us that we can always go to questions for. We um, work with them in clinics at times. Uh, they're with our support groups. They're there to give expert advice when needed. And we really look at about five and a half thousand support inquiries every year and that's growing all the time. We tend to start off with navigation for specialist assessment. So people often come to us when they're unsure of their diagnosis, whether they've got symptoms and they've had a previous diagnosis and they don't feel it's right or they're struggling to get a diagnosis themselves. So I'm going to talk a bit about that this morning, um, but that the, tends to be where we start off with. And then after diagnosis, we do a lot of psychoeducation and understanding of the disease. And that involves a lot of emotional support because it's a big shock for people, um, but also a lot of practical support as well, giving strategies and achieving some outcomes for people. We help people do their advanced care plan in a very sensitive way. So looking forward to the future and putting things into place, which are gonna be really important for them to do and important for them to do at an early stage. So they feel very empowered in control of this. And we also look at empowering people to live well, to, to keep independent for as long as possible. And looking at people's well-being is a really big part of the work that we do. We always try to look at it in two different ways of the dementia diagnosis, but also the well-being as well and what we can achieve with enhancing people's well-being. We're there to give advice on care options and transitioning at different stages. Um, 
um, one of the really lovely things that we do, which is getting people together, connecting people. When people have a diagnosis of a rare dementia, they often feel very, very isolated. So if they, we can connect people with others in the same boat, it is really helpful for them. And we've had people making great friends along the way. And why do we do this? Well, we've got five and 15 percent of people that are living with dementia have actually got a dementia of a rare type or often a young onset dementia. So, you know, the specialist support is really geared towards this rather than a generic dementia diagnosis. We often see 30 percent of the people have that do end up having a rare dementia first receive an incorrect uh, diagnosis and this is often a psychi psychiatric diagnosis as well. Many are just left with the diagnosis of dementia and no more questions are sort of put forward to why is this and we help people to have a further understanding and get that clarity out there and we often see that there is a widespread of lack of understanding and resources to help people once they have got their diagnosis. So as I said, we often start with the navigation and that's people coming to us themselves, so self-referrals, or we get lots of referrals from a lot of the local teams. I know a lot of you are here today joining. So a lot of people from the Alzheimer's Society, from Age UK, from Mind and all the other different organisations as well. And when we start off with that support, we are listening to people's initial concerns. What is actually wrong? What they feel that their symptoms are, what their anxieties are, what's not actually working with sort of what they've got at the moment and it's a bit of a sort of pre-screening without being clinical it's really sort of looking listening to what's been going on in the background and what the concerns are and what uh, interventions have been go have gone on so far and we can tap into our clinical advice for this so I'm quite often speaking to Natalie or our other colleagues or other consultants to say you know we're a bit concerned here should we put this person forward for more specialist interventions to a specialist service and we look at where people live are living in the country and we've got a good network of neurologists or psychiatrists which specialize in the rare dementias now so we try and link people up to somewhere which is going to be uh, easy for them to get to, but also that they've got the right people looking at their uh, symptoms as well. So it's understanding what cognitive neurology is for people, but also understanding what their local services will be able to offer and if they'll be able to meet their needs here. And quite often we do end up referring people to the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, which I know Natalie is going to talk all about today, um, and how to guide people for this. And because most people come to us as self-referrals or through another agency, a voluntary agency and a charity, we need them to go back to their GPs and to get a referral through the e-referral system for this. There are other ways um, people can be referred, which Natalie is going to talk about. Um, but this is normally our navigation at that point when we're, when we're helping to start the journey supporting people of getting their GP on board and getting them involved for this. So I'm going to hand over to Natalie now and she's going to continue sort of with the journey here. Thank you very much Nikki. Let me share my screen. That was fantastic. Um... Okay, can everybody see? Somebody shouts. <laughs> Nikki, can you see? Yes, we can see it lovely and clear. Thank you. Okay, so, and and again, thank you, Julie, for sharing your story so eloquently and really sorry to hear that you had that experience. So, and um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Natalie Ryan. I'm a neurologist at the Dementia Research Centre and Dementia Research Institute at UCL, where my research specialises in young onset, atypical and familial Alzheimer's disease. Alongside this, I see patients in the Cognitive Disorders Clinic at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. And I'm also very involved in rare dementia support. I'm clinical co-lead for the familial AD support group. And I really see these three roles as completely intertwined. And I, as I'll be talking about today, I think that um, working in, a, in an environment where research, clinical and support group activities run hand in hand is, is, is really important. And I think provides a lot of opportunities for us to address these issues about how we can improve the journey from um, to diagnosis and beyond. So of course, everybody's journey is different though. So how do we first look at that? 
Okay, so I, I wanted to just start by sharing this slide, which was um, um, lent to me by Charlie Harrison, a creative consultant with Rare Dementia Support, who's done a lot of work um, with participants and um, with generating creative outputs. And, um, and I was really interested to hear that actually this, this approach is used in some of the, the programmes that RDS runs. Um, so here, individuals are asked to, to try and think back to when they first noticed something was wrong and draw a line or, or draw, draw an image that describes the journey. And I think this can be a really helpful way of um, pe people talking through their experiences whilst also demonstrating them. And I, I want to use this as a sort of jumping off point to maybe think about these three areas of the diagnostic process and how we can help to improve each of these, both from an individual level, but also as, as a society. And, and, and thank you, as I meant to mention at the beginning, thank you all for introducing yourself on the chat. It's really, really wonderful to see um, the, the huge geographical breadth of um, people attending this, this seminar. So thank you. OK, so this was an individual with PCA who, who, who said that it was like an explosion, not an immediate explosion, but over a period of a year or so where all of this was happening that I couldn't understand. And that's what these little lines represent. It's all those little things that come up to make this big thing, this build up. So there's, there's this first part, this, this part where, where, where symptoms are developing. And, and if you think about all the people that an individual might meet it when, when they're starting to develop these symptoms, how can we raise awareness and, and make sure that, that those symptoms get, get detected at an early stage? And then as the journey progressed with the assessments and everything, I started to get a little bit of understanding, they say. And then the huge relief. I found it a huge relief when I got the diagnosis. And of course, that's not everyone's experience when they receive the diagnosis. And, and and I'm sure and it's accompanied by lots of different feelings. But how, how can we help to make that that receiving of the diagnosis be something that's empowering as, as, as well as all, all the negative emotions that go with it? Um, so, yes, this first stage is the awareness of the symptoms, and, and it's particularly difficult when the, the symptoms are, are atypical. So by atypical, what we're talking about is, is not memory. So um, a typical manifestation of Alzheimer's disease and would be with me progressive memory symptoms, and that's even at a young age. But in, in young onset Alzheimer's disease, atypical presentations are much more common. And um, so PCA, posterior cortical atrophy, is the most common of these atypical um, presentations. But young onset Alzheimer's disease can also present with changes in behavior and with changes in language and logopenic and progressive aphasia and, 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 and sometimes with, with motor features as well like, like in, in something we call corticobasal syndrome. So I, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more later. But so thinking back about to the people who may see someone with, with PCA, let's give them as an example. So ophthalmologists, opticians, the GP, friends, neighbors, family, all it takes is one person really to say this could be a, a cognitive disorder and actually referral to a neurologist is, 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 is what's going to be, be needed and might lead to the diagnosis being made as early as possible. And um, so as Nikki said, we accept referrals nationally from primary, secondary and tertiary care, GP referrals, and um, this is from our website, by the way, and um, from the NHS e-res e service, and um, but uh, uh, from secondary and tertiary care, you can write a referral letter um, and, or, or email it to, to our cognitive disorders clinic inbox. And, and obviously, as, as Nikki said, there are lots of excellent cognitive neurologists across the country, so we may not be the first port of call. And, 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 and I think, again, that's one thing that is, you know, RDS is, is really helpful for is linking up to where, where might be the best place to seek referral. So what happens when the referral arrives? And um, well, all referrals are tri triaged by a consultant to make sure that really this is the best pathway. So things that might not be um, accepted to, to the clinic are, for example, someone who's got stable cognitive impairment following a traumatic brain injury. So there are specialists and um, traumatic brain injury clinics where, where someone in that situation may be better served. Or if it looks like the from the referral, like somebody's got cognitive symptoms, but in the context of active drug or alcohol misuse or an, an, an active mental illness that looks like it you know requires quite urgent attention from a community mental health team then we would suggest please can the referral be made to the CMHT first or even in parallel but always with the open door to come back and refer to us and um, if appropriate afterwards. And then before the appointment happens there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to really make sure that 
um, that, that, that it's maximized, that we have as much information to help inform us on the appointment day. So this is tapping into this part of the, the diagnosis journey, really trying to shorten that. So we have excellent secretaries who request all the previous investigations and imaging, um, and we have a weekly neuroradiology meeting where we re review this. This is if someone's being referred for a second opinion. Obviously, we also see people as, as their, their, their first stop. Um, we send out a cognitive questionnaire a month before the appointment, which is really useful because I think this gives people a chance to reflect on what, what what have been the first symptoms, what's happened so far. We ask them to um, list all the any other specialists involved in their care, and so that we can copy them into our letters. And then it's really helpful if they also um, copy us into their correspondence to really make sure that our care is as coordinated as possible. Because often you do need that network of of a specialist clinic, but also the local team who know what's available locally to support an individual. And then the week before the clinic. Um, and we, the clinic's prepared by consultants and also a, a fellow in clinic. And we have a number of slots um, for same day MRI and neuropsychology testing. So we, we think who will be most appropriate for those slots. And we're a big service. There are over 10 consultants seeing people in clinics on different days of the week. So um, sometimes a referral will come through to see a named consultant. So they'll be booked into their clinic. But if not, it will be and they'll be booked into the next available slot. And then the clinic appointment itself is an hour. And so that's really the, the benefit, I guess, of seeing someone in a cognitive neurology clinic. We have much longer in our appointments um, than in a general neurology clinic where a new patient slot would typically be half an hour. And um, so this is really a chance to go through things in a lot of detail, a detailed history. And we're also, um, because these patients are often young, looking at the family history in a lot of detail, looking for any additional neurological or systemic features that might suggest um, particular diagnoses and a detailed cognitive and neurological examination. And um, so again, using the example of PCA, as, as many of you will have known who see patients, it's often this signs of visuoperceptual impairments are often obvious, even just on, on, on the mini mental state examination with the intersecting pentagons. But we're looking more detail, looking at um, ability to perceive fragmented letters on a bedside test and dot counting tests of visio spatial skills, looking at praxis and spelling calculation, these other posterior cortical functions that are really sensitive and um, to, to the degeneration in this syndrome. Um, and I wanted to briefly mention the neurological examination as well, because actually motor features can be seen in PCA. And this is a real example of, um, of, of learning from, from people with the illness. I When I, I started working at the Dementia Research Centre 15 years ago, and this was before RDS had been formed as an umbrella organisation, but the PCA support group was already going strong. And so I would go along to their meetings regularly. And I learned so much from my conversations um, with people there. And I remembered doing a question and answer session one day and um, someone said is it anything to do with my PCA that I'm you know that I've got difficulty moving my arm it's stiff it, it sometimes jerks and I've got a tremor and we asked around the room and so this was actually not uncommon in, in, in the people in that room so we went on to study it with a, a research study um, and found that actually 30% of the individuals in our cohort had some motor features and um, so there's this overlap with what we call the cortico base or syndrome, um, which can include limb rigidity, myoclonus, these are um, involuntary small jerking movements, tremor, um, apraxia, so difficulty with coordinated movements, and sometimes something called alien limb phenomenon, where the, the, the arm moves of, of its own accord. And interestingly, we found that despite these symptoms, the majority of people in that study had underlying Alzheimer's disease pathology, either at post-mortem or on um, CSF, um, cerebral spinal fluid examination, supporting that they, they may still benefit from symptomatic therapy with a cholinesterase inhibitor. And so you can read more about the consensus classification um, uh, criteria for PCA in this paper published in 2017. And again, a lot of the features um, described here, I can, can trace them back to you know, conversations within, within support group settings. Um, so the investigations that we then go ahead to arrange are very much led by the, the, the clinical syndrome, the clinical phenotype. Um, but we do, we've, MRI tends to be the, 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 the initial investigation. And obviously some people have had these elsewhere. So we'll always have a look beforehand and, and think about are there any additional MRI sequences or has enough time gone that it would be useful to repeat um, scanning. 
So international gu diagnostic guidelines, including NICE recommends imaging, um, to, firstly, to rule out reversible causes of cognitive decline. So tumors and subdural hematomas, things that, things that actually could be potentially addressed and, 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 and have an impact. Um, but that sort of historical approach of only doing imaging to, to check for reversible causes is, is, is really being superseded by the awareness that imaging can also assist in, in specifying and subtyping the diagnosis. And in our view, MRI is really the preferred modality for this. It's got excellent tissue contrast and there's a lack of radiation that you get with CT. And it is superior in detecting atrophy patterns, vascular burden and signal change. And different MRI sequences are different uh, um, sensitive to different aspects of pathology. So susceptibility weighted imaging sequences like gradient echo and um, sensitive to microbleeds, which are, are really important when we're thinking about disease modifying therapies in the future. And so here's a couple of examples. This is an MRI scan from somebody with PCA, and you can see this dramatic posterior atrophy, but with preserved hippocampal volume. So that scan, along with a very typical clinical presentation, would, you, would give you a lot of confidence in, in, in the diagnosis. And sometimes the imaging can actually really suggest a diagnosis that was less apparent from the clinical phenotype. And so these are scans from somebody I saw um, years ago who presented with a behavioral and disexecutive syndrome. He was um, young, but was adopted. So nothing was known about his family history. And it, it looked like it could be a frontotemporal dementia. But actually, his imaging showed these, I don't know if you can see them very well, these little black dots, these scattered cortical microbleeds, multiple microbleeds, and also these um, white matter hyperintensities. These are suggestive of um, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, so deposition of amyloid beta in the blood vessels, which um, can be a part of Alzheimer's disease. And we do see, in, in, in particularly in association with certain familial AD mutations, and he did indeed have a pre one um, mutation. So there the imaging completely um, dictated the, the next stage of investigation of genetic testing in his case. Um, so even in familial Alzheimer's disease, which typically presents with progressive memory symptoms, you can see um, atypical presentations we saw in about 15% in our cohort. And you can, I could talk for a long time about this as it's an area of my research, but um, I, I won't. So you can look at these papers if you'd like to read more. But just to say the main um, atypical presentations we saw were behavioral symptoms, um, although there were language and dyscalculic presentations as well. And um, PCA presentations are exceptionally, exceptionally rare in familial AD, despite the young onset. Okay, so, uh, sorry, the other important thing to say is that a normal MRI bra brain scan, of course, doesn't exclude um, a diagnosis, an underlying neurodegenerative diagnosis. So particularly in young patients, it's not uncommon for imaging to really look quite normal in the early stages of things. So um, if, the, if the clinical presentation and examination suggests um, a, a degenerative symptom, we're, we, we're never reassured by a normal MRI brain scan. And actually for us, often the next step is, is to um, arrange a lumbar puncture to, for CSF analysis. And we're very lucky to have a nurse-led um, LP clinic on our daycare unit. And uh, if, for anyone who wants to sort of read a bit more about CSF um, examination in dementia, this uh, paper by my colleague Ashvini Keshavan and colleagues is, I think, really helpful introduction. It's in practical neurology and um, just about the practicalities about uh, how the LP clinic runs, but also about how, uh, how you can interpret the tests. Um, so in and CSF analysis is much more useful in, in younger individuals because af after the age of 70, about a third of us will have abnormal um, reduced AAB to 42 to 40 ratios, which is, is, is um, a similar proportion of people have a amyloid pathology post-mortem and it's, that's not necessarily the reflection of the cause of the clinical syndrome. Whereas in young people, the positive predictive value of a low AB to 42 to 40 ratio for diagnosing AD is much higher. And of course, the, specific, the importance of a molecular the diagnosis is going to become much more important in the era of disease modifying therapy, which we, we, we do hope we're on the cusp of. So I'm sure you've all seen the, um, the press release last year about um, the positive results of the Alicanumab trial, followed up by this publication in New England Journal of Medicine, and then the FDA licensing in, in, in the US in January. Obviously, we don't know what um, the situation is going to be here, but there are a number of amyloid modifying therapies with trials reading out later and um, in, in, in the future. And 
clearly it's going to need a big change to our clinical services. So we're starting to think about how this might work and really how we can all work together and build the network and, and collection connections and collaborations to be able to offer these if and when they become available. So a save the date here, we're planning a um, currently planning a symposium on preparing for disease modifying therapies for dementia and um, at UCL and I hope we'll have a hybrid option that I, I'll be able to circulate details about close to the time. Um, so then moving now on now to, to diagnosing, discussing the diagnosis. And again, when this happens is obviously different for different people. For some people, we see them just at the start of um, the, the process of diagnosis, whereas for other people, by the time they've seen us, they've already had a lot of experience investigations locally and it may be that having reviewed these and reviewed them and we know with the benefit of the passage of time we're able to make a, a diagnosis when we see them that first time and um, and so you know general approach is to give plenty of time to explain as much as they want to know and give time for questions and I I do really try to emphasize that this is such there is such variability in progression and um, and really try and emphasize the importance of focusing on strengths and talk, we'll talk about strategies for managing symptoms and, um, you know, the importance of keeping physically fit and doing, doing, focusing on activities that, that, that play to the cognitive strengths. Because actually in, in all of these conditions, there are areas of, in the early stages of cognition that are still well preserved. And I think there's a tendency to focus on, on the things that are difficult where, and, and so I really try to help people also see the things that they're doing very well and how they can build on that. If um, the diagnosis is Alzheimer's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies, then we um, talk about the option of starting symptomatic therapy with a cholinesterase inhibitor, and we can prescribe that from clinics so they can go home with it. And I would also mention um, memantine in, in Alzheimer's disease is something we might want to uh, introduce um, once they're established. And we try and start that actually fairly quickly so that people can benefit um, at, at the stage where, they, where they're most able to benefit. We talk about, think about whether there are other people that they might want to have on their teams, whether specialist referrals that, that could help them. So in PCA, perhaps and referral to a local ophthalmologist so that they can be registered as partially sighted. And in primary progressive aphasia with there's language problems, and referral to speech, a specialist speech and language therapists. And we, we have specialists and speech and language therapists with us in clinics. So sometimes they can also see them on the same day. We'd start the conversation about practical considerations, informing the DVLA, thinking about ranging needs assessments and thinking about finances, future planning. I mean, how much of that really just depends on the individual? Sometimes people really have been thinking about these things themselves and really want to talk to, um, to me about them. But for other people, it, it might that might be a bit too much at, at that point of diagnosis. And so um, we have excellent specialist nurses linked with our clinic who, who are in clinic. And so if someone wants to go and speak with them after their appointment with me we can arrange that or if they'd rather talk separately and once they've sort of had a bit of time to take everything in, on board in a separate telephone appointment we can arrange that too and they can be contacted through an email address and telephone and between appointments so we have that um, constant sort of weigh in and any queries that need to come to one of the clinicians and one of the consultants and we'll, we'll get diverted to the right person. And we also, you know, we try and talk about hope. We try and talk about things that people can do, things that they might want to find out about, including research opportunities. Um, and so we, we actually have a, a research study that we're doing in clinic at the moment. So we're inviting everybody who had a, a clinical MRI scan to consider whether they'd be willing to join this research study, BRAPID, which stands for Biomarkers and Rapid Imaging in Dementia Diagnosis. And that involves just staying in the scanner for five, seven minutes longer than um, they would otherwise. Um, in the attempt, because this is led by my um, mentor, Professor Nick Fox, who's developing more rapid MRI sequences, um, and they're also invited to donate a blood sample for blood biomarker analysis. And really, this is, again, thinking about how we can, uh, in, you know, in a broader sense, um, improve the diagnostic journey. Wouldn't it be amazing if an MRI scan could take five minutes rather than 30 minutes? That would hugely open up access to MRI and hopefully democratise diagnosis because we know there's so much variability in access to imaging at the moment. So um, watch this space for this, but I have to say that the initial scans from um, these sequences look really, really good. 
Um, and we also talk about trials. So um, not, they're not for everybody, but anyone who's interested in finding about joining a clinical trial, we, we have a whole host of trials um, running through an excellent clinical trials team run by Cass Mummery at our centre. And these images are from the clinical trials leaflet that we're currently updating. And um, there's this inbox for DSD trial inquiries um, for anyone who wants to find out about currently um, running trials and whether they may be eligible. And this is open to individuals from outside our clinic as well so um you know always do feel free to get in touch if if you if you, you have a if you're seeing someone or, or are someone who wants to learn more and we also actively support joint dementia research which matches participants up to appropriate research studies through the uk and this is my last slide, I think. So, and 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 trial participation and, and research participation in general. I think there's a there's a real awareness that this offers a, a lot more than just the participation in the research. People um, I often talk to us about feeling the empowerment of knowing they're doing something really active to try and to try and change things for this disease, and and that goes beyond research and trial participation. And I think is is part of uh, what people experience from being part of RD, uh, RDS and of the conversations that occur here. And I I just thought I'd mention this this study um, and this, this these are some of the papers that you might want to look at if you want to learn more about this. And, and some of the activities that we've done. So am I the right way up was a, was a question an individual with PCA asked, um, asked one day and, and it, came to, it was raised to us in a support group meeting. And that opened up a whole host of activities, uh, a research study funded by the Alzheimer's study, um, a load of creative activities, really trying to understand and um, balance difficulties in PCA, which before, before really, igniting that that um that direction of research were really underappreciated but but do seem to be something that that is a, a, a significant problem for 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 a lot of people and so just these are some more um papers about some of the artistic outputs that have come through collaborations between um individuals who are part of rds and um, clinicians researchers and an and artist, and I, I do think these are so important for, for changing how, how we view dementia and, and really raising awareness so that people do get that early diagnosis that is, is, is that can be so important and, and really, um, I do think, enhance the, the diagnostic journey. So thank you for everyone for, for listening and particularly thank you to all the individuals who participated in Shape Our Research, not just through the contributions they make, but through the questions they ask and the stories they share. And if you want to learn more about PCA and other atypical dementias, I'd really recommend this online course, The Many Faces of Dementia, which tells um, the stories of, of um, a number of less common diagnoses and this film that can be accessed on the Rare Dementia Support um, website of, made by an artist in collaboration with people with PCA where it was beautiful animation and where they they describe their stories and I think to really step inside their worlds and 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 understand what what it's like it's it, it can help us all to think about how we can help make life better okay I will stop there Thank you, Natalie. It's fascinating and it's an absolute pleasure to work alongside you and the rest of the team. And just so many things that are going on in, in the clinics, in research, and so much hope for the future for everybody as well. So thank you. It's it's so informative and I, I really hope that that's um lots of food for thought, everybody that's here today, and so many wonderful people in the chat. It's great. It's lovely to see how every, where everybody is all over the country and, and all the fantastic services that are out there already as well. Right, I'm just going to see if I can share my screen again to get up in the second of my um, presentation. Here we go. Nikki, could I just interrupt and um, just because uh, we've slightly overrun, and we need to just allow enough um, time, at least 10 minutes or so for the questions. I wondered if you would be able to just reduce a little bit. I, I will indeed. I will do a whistle stop tour for the Thank end of, for the next part of this. Well, not too, not too, uh, <laughs> not speaking too fast, hopefully, but yeah. um, because we can always, um, we can always add the slides, Nikki. Sure, absolutely. Email. 
Yes. So we're going to talk a little bit about the post-diagnostic support now. And this is really carrying on from what Natalie spoke about, about um, understanding the diagnosis at the clinic appointment. And we just really sort of reiterate that with people of what their diagnosis is, if they understood everything in the clinic appointment, what their symptoms are, and really what, the, what their abilities are. And, you know, matching tasks now to their abilities, looking at how they need to make some adaptations in their, their lives um, and really sort of looking to the future to see how this is going to continue to impact and what sort of things they may need to want to put into place. So we support all people and all families. So quite often it can be family support that we're involved in the whole lot of the family. And sometimes it's just individuals and sometimes there's individuals that live on their own and we need to support them to be as independent as possible. So we do initial one-to-one -one sort of psychoeducational sessions. And we often do these by Zoom. We just sort of find it's a, a nicer sort of medium to use. We're a national service. We are based in London, but we are national. We have people that we are referred to all over the country. So unfortunately we can't do that face-to-face -face sitting in the room, but over Zoom it feels it's a, it's a good um, option going forward for us. And we, we go through the whole understanding of the diagnosis, what this means, how it's going to impact on people. And we back up our conversations with different resources. So things that people can uh, go back to at a later stage to, to ensure that they're living well properly, the, the tools that they've got in their toolkit for caring for a loved one and, and what can be helpful for children. So if there's children involved, there's lots of web, there's a few websites that we use information from, but we, we often do sort of one to one sessions with the family, breaking down things to make it, it much easier to understand for children as well. With, with the resources that we use, we have got lots of educational webinars in on our RDS YouTube channel. So there's quite often uh, coping strategies tips and tricks, uh, learning to live with the diagnosis, those sorts of things, which we give to our new members that are, are new to the service and haven't had the opportunity to, to watch these, to give them an idea of what sort of things that we can do to help with, but also how they can incorporate this into their own lives. And a lot of these webinars include people that are living with a diagnosis as well. Uh, you know, the this is the most um, influential medium I find is actually hearing from people like um, Julie today, talking through their experiences, talking about how they've adapted their life and how they're living well. And we have monthly support groups for all the different types of dementia and we split them into people living with the diagnosis and carers as well so they've got their own platforms they've got their own private sort of space that they can discuss issues with fellow members that are going through similar situations and then of course we have our large annual meetings which are in London we have them every year um, and it's just a fantastic opportunity for people to come and meet others in person. So when we're talking to people with our post-diagnostic support, we want to help them put things into place that are really important for them. So the legal and financial issues which they, they need to deal with. Um, and we encourage people to do this as quickly as possible. So things like their lasting powers attorney, appointing people, sorting out their wills, uh, looking at their future care plans for the future. It's not something people want to look at, but sometimes it, it's quite um, important if we can get people to start thinking about these things early on. And also looking at sort of the benefits and the entitlements that they can have. We often really sort of put across to people how important it is to be registered as a carer because it opens up so many doors and it makes it much easier for them to speak to health professionals as well. And I think probably the biggest bowl of contention that we have is driving and looking at whether people still can drive when it's time to stop driving and what needs to be put into place legally for this. But of course, what we want people to concentrate on is living and living full lives as well. 
I'm not going to go through this slide, but we do talk to people about work if people are working. And it's really the importance of knowing their rights at work. And this slide will be um, coming around to you as well. So you'll be able to have a look at this and to see what reasonable adjustments are, how an occupationist health um, can actually really be beneficial within this process and also how to get some legal advice for that. You can contact us about that. So one of the main things that, and is going on from what Natalie talked about is the positive things and really looking at people's strengths. But everybody's strengths are very different. So what really is important to us is obviously what's important to know what the disease person that person actually has, whether it's PCA or FTD. Uh, PPA it can really vary person to person, but also what person the disease has. And that's really very integral to person centered care. And what we've really helped people with is writing their can do list. What can they do really well for themselves? What do they need help with? So having a list of things that they really enjoy doing, but they need to adapt the way they do it to match their abilities for this. And it's all about people's personal choices, what they enjoy, their hobbies, the tasks that they have to do for their everyday life and what they want to be part of this. We really encourage people to make the most out of their hobbies that they've got and discover some new ones, joining new groups, but only things they want. And we want this to be part of their life and not put down, as I've put here, as meaningful activities. I, I really find that that phrase a bit sort of patronising to people. I think people should all have activities in their life and they should all be meaningful for them and not just when they've got a diagnosis. And... We are a national organisation, as I've explained, we're based in London, but we do reach out all over the country, but we can't do this on our own. We need all of you guys there that have joined today, people from the Alzheimer's Society, Dementia Support Services, um, all the local teams as well, so we can all work together as a tag team. So we've got national and local support involved. We really encourage people to get involved with their local care centres, the Age UK, and community groups and support groups and the activity groups of their choice. And really to know in their area who are the local health and social care teams. So to, to be on their radar, even if they don't need them, to know who they are is going to be really important for their future care. We can't do everything ourselves and we need all you guys to join in with us to support people. Nikki, oh, I, I'm really sorry. I think we'll need to leave it there. That's um, fine, no problem. It's just a, a list of uh, health uh, support we do for health professionals, which we will circle, circulate as well. And we're more than happy yeah. to speak to health professionals as well. Yes, we'll, we'll definitely circulate that. Um, uh, no, nobody will miss out on that. So, so thank you so much, both Nikki and Natalie. Fantastic. Um, bit of a whiz, but let, let's look at some questions. And um, if you've got, uh, if you're able to stay a little beyond um, uh, 130, then that would be very helpful. Um, but but let's see how we go. So um, I definitely stay, and I apologise for for running over with my talk. That's okay. Uh, the slides are very detailed, and it, you know there'll be there'll be great benefit in being able to to look at them um, after as well, read them through. So. Um, I think uh, I think Nikki that you covered this. What area do you serve? Well, like I said, we, we are national and international. We've got members from all over the world that actually come to us, and obviously it varies where people live and what we can do for them. And that this is why you know we are we do partner with local teams. I can give somebody really good advice on their dementia, on their rare dementia, and what we can help with resources, help them get the support that they need as far as what sort of questions to ask and what resources are. But if somebody comes to me and says, I live in Huddersfield and I want to join a local group, we really need you local guys on board for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you feel locally there should be specialist teams within the memory clinics who support people diagnosed with young onset dementia? What's your, what's your views on that, both of you? I mean, I think that could be really helpful. It's, it's, you know, the needs are often so different, aren't they? And, um, 
you know, I and and having that local knowledge it would be incredibly helpful. And and you know, I, I hope I know a lot of places are doing that. And and I, I recognise someone on the call who came to sit in on our clinic um, uh, uh, recently, and that was that was incredibly useful both ways because now I know that um, patients in her area, I can contact her, and she knows what we do. And and I'm sure Nikki would have the same experience. So, um, yeah, we clearly need. There's no. <laughs> there's never going to be too many people. Um, out there supporting these individuals and the more we can actually connect then th 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 that can only be a good thing. I think it would be really useful if anyone um, on the call on the webinar um, puts their the services that they know actually into the chat and then we can uh, th then we can take a look to see what's what's out there sort of map it really um, and if you know of um, young onset service or expertise within teams because often it's not identified is it as a, as a particular dedicated service then that would be useful too so just throw all that information into the chat um the, the question too was um what would that service look like any thoughts on that either nikki or natalie it's it's difficult because what, what we would like in a perfect world to what is locally commissioned can be very, very different. Um, and I think it's looking at the numbers within the areas of how many people are diagnosed with a young onset or a rare dementia. I think, you know, joining some memory services with neurology. So there is that overlap to get that specialism from cognitive neurology within memory services would be fantastic. And to have that support at point of diagnosis I think that that's something that we know is available in some clinics but when it's missing or they're not there that day it can be such a big gap for people yeah yeah for sure is there training for GPs or mental health specialists who work for GP surgeries so that they have greater awareness and can they can therefore re refer in a more timely way we are just working on some training at the moment, packages at the moment. We're always more than happy to have phone calls, Zooms with GPs, any healthcare professionals. But we are we are sorting out some proper training packages. And as Natalie already spoke about, was that Many Faces of Dementia is an online course. It's free and it's excellent. Um, uh, we, we get asked this question all the time of can we go and train all the GPs? Um, I, I wish I had time. I really do wish I had time. It's an ongoing thing, but we are open to GPs and other health professionals. And we do get lots coming to our seminars as well now. I think um, uh, the Many Faces um, link has been put into the chat. Um, uh, it's so also on the slides. So I think on, bo on both of the slides in case you miss it. Belt and braces, belt and braces, good. Um, so this is a question. I have a young lady on my caseload who's been around the system for different investigations for almost a year now. She's left work and there are very clear changes. Uh, would this lady be a, a good candidate for referral to the Dementia Research Centre? Maybe a tricky one to answer, but... Um, yeah, it's difficult without knowing the details, but if someone, I mean, it sounds like if they're young onset and presumably if they're being supported by by um, one of you, they there is a query about dementia. So I, I would have said they, yes, whether it's um, to the Queen Square Clinic or if they've got a local cognitive neurology clinic. I mean, I for all these sort of individual queries, I... I you know, these these are things that actually Nikki, the direct support team, if someone thinks that they has had a presumptive diagnosis of there was somebody with possibly PPA and Lewy body disease and is struggling to navigate the system that I, I am I right in thinking that you can they they can self register for to join RDS and ask to have a, a, yeah. a one chat. for Yeah, for absolutely. Question. Yeah. Just, you know, get in contact with us and we'll we'll talk through sort of the situation and, and you know, where, where they are in the system it sometimes it's just lack of clarity isn't it yeah yeah um so this is a reference back to julie's experience at, at diagnosis is anyone aware of tools and resources already available that could improve um the situation you know for, for somebody like julie uh, and and this is being asked because uh, the person's working on a project with lancaster university where we're trying to address the issue so is this for the after diagnosis or 
pre-diagnosis? I was a bit unclear with the question. Um, given Julie's experience at, at diagnosis, is anyone aware of tools and resources already available that could improve this? Maybe there could be, if, if Matt's still with us, um, maybe you could clarify that. Um, well, well, it's yeah. very useful information on the website, isn't there? I, yeah, uh, yeah. He, if you could, if you could send send an email to us, we could we could have a conversation of what what we could do because we've got lot we've got lots of resources. Okay, okay. Um, is there a maximum dose of rivastigmine that it doesn't seem to do very much? I don't know whether that's that's one that you can answer. Is there a maximum dose? I, mean, I think this is these in the most efficient. I think we need to we'd need to sort of know a bit more about the the, the context and who yeah. who is probably not really the right appropriate setting for medication advice. <laughs> no, I, I think I, I yeah, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Um, um, this is a comment in terms of a diagnosis of. Um, Lewy body dementia. Um, curious as to why doctors base their diagnosis on one test or one symptom in particular, um, rather than looking at the whole. Um, and also a comment about the type of language that can be very um, damaging for those seeking a diagnosis. Just asking for your thoughts there. No, I mean I think you're right. It's we have it's language is is so important, and you know, saying things like the wrong type of symptom is is really unhelpful. I mean, different scans tap into different aspects of pathology. So a DAT scan is really looking at what's happening, looking at whether there's um, depletion of uh, d dopamine. It's it's a molecular imaging, so that is really quite specific. Whereas an FTG scan, an FTG PET scan looks at overall brain activity and can be affected by lots of things actually it can be abnormal in depression as well so I wonder if that's where that comes from but obviously you know individual case queries I think if if, if someone everyone is entitled to ask for a second opinion and um, and and especially to entitled to ask for a first opinion so you know really upsetting to see that people are struggling to get a GP to refer them at all to a specialist and and that's not okay and 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 I think at RDS and and through the Young Dementia Network we can help advocate for that I mean I think going into a GP practice and showing them what you think you know some I've, I've asked people in the past who've struggled actually more with familial Alzheimer's disease to go in with the information from the website look this this is this exists this is what I think I have please refer me and you know sometimes I followed that up with <laughs> encouraging emails but it's it it shouldn't have to be such a such a fight and and actually just it's amazing to see how many amazing services out are out there I guess maybe one question back at people is if so and so in the areas where you, you've got really a lot of and um, great input um, young dementia specialist nurses and advisors uh, can can you help these people navigate you know can you if someone's struggling to get a referral from their GP can you can you support people through that can people go get in touch with their local Alzheimer's society for example and and ask a dementia advisor to to help them with you know in for an individual local GP practice if that's the point of struggling I don't know how anyone's going to answer that but Nikki is that something you've encountered with yeah we all the time we almost write scripts for them Natalie you yeah. know it's like yeah. go to your GP and say this you have the right to ask for this you you in it you know you do nobody deserves to have a diagnosis of just dementia or even just young onset dementia that's not a proper diagnosis is it we need to know what the cause is and if you don't understand you need to, you know, to be able to ask for clarity on that and actually through the cognitive and disorders clinic inbox I, I i think i think if there are issues about funding and a gp practice actually just needs confirmation of the funding pathway that um you know there are people can who can help clarify that because because it is a specialist service there are commissioning pathways available and and actually the the you know i often see when we see someone that there's an email trail of of confirmation of the funding that has permitted that referral for a second opinion to be made uh, a quick question. Do you support dementia and um, MS, multiple cirrhosis? 
Yes, absolutely. If if there was a query, I mean, actually, that is, does sometimes happen. Is 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 the dementia part of the MS, or is it something separate? And you know, that we we absolutely see people who've got an existing neurological or psychiatric diagnosis, and the, there's a question about about the cause of of the progressive cognitive impairments. Thank you. Um, how do we influence acute hospitals to prioritize MRI scans for dementia? During COVID, scans stopped, which worsened uh, diagnosis and the and the delays involved. Have you got a Have you got an answer for that? That would be. That would be very useful because that's a, quite a problem, isn't it? Well, I mean, that's what this research study is aiming. So I think um, currently a, an MRI scan is a half hour slot by the time you've got someone in. If that was five minutes, then that would be complete. Think, you know, how can't do the maths, but you, you would get so many people um, scanned in, in the same time. But we the, there's so many levels of 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 um, where this can be addressed. And I, and I do think actually that thinking about how services are going to have to adapt to the arrival of disease modifying therapy and getting people talking is, is, is so important. So I've, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to people working in community mental health teams about the difficulty they have accessing MRI. And it's, 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 it's just awful how disconnected it is. So we all need to come together. And actually sometimes it's the arrival of a treatment that really, um, catalyzes that that we've seen that in stroke for example i'm going to, thank you natalie i'm going to uh, pose one more question can i partner or get support from someone to do seminars webinars in jamaica and the caribbean oh so that, it's that's <laughs> who wants to go on a holiday to the caribbean yeah i think we i think we're both going yeah me and natalie will be over next week yes You've got a couple of volunteers that, that lady who are asked that question, but but seriously, uh, is, is there a way to, to link up and support a webinar? Please, please, please um, yeah, get in contact with us, contact at Rare Dementia Support. We're, you know, we've got lots of international connections now, so we're always looking to, to see we, where we can help everybody, wherever they are. And, you know, one good thing that came out of the pandemic is this global village that we now have. Yeah. So look, thank you so much, uh, Natalie and, and Nikki, for that very, very informative um, webinar. It was That was great. There's so much in the chat that we need to read through uh, afterwards, I think. And also just check that uh, we've answered a, a good number of the questions, which I think we have. I'm going to end by just uh, just uh, picking up a comment from uh, that's in the, the Q&A. Thank you for a wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And thank you for everybody who attended today. Yes, and, and thank you so much. So so our, our next one, um, there will be a follow up email with all the slides, the recordings, um, the, the useful links and such like that are being put into the chat as well. So you'll, you'll all receive that and all registrants will receive that. But but also look out for May the 24th. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've been asked for is to start sharing some different models of uh, young onset services or services that include young onset um, really well. So we're going to be doing that from May the 24th onwards. But but you can um, you'll be able to join by um, following the link in the follow up um, email that's coming out in the next couple of days. But meantime, apologies for running over a bit. But um, I hope you thought the the exchanges were were, were worth your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>